So I'd like to introduce, without any further ado, uh, Mac Gonzalez. It's, uh, it's always difficult to hear about all my political defeats. <laughs> um, I've run four times and won one race. In baseball, that wouldn't be very good average. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up in a, a town in South Texas, McAllen, Texas. And uh, you're not missing anything, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I grew up in South Texas, in McAllen, Texas. And um, I became an attorney, and I started work in the public defender office in San Francisco. And I spent about a decade doing that work before, uh, as David mentioned, I ran for district attorney. Um, I ran because I had represented a young person in a marijuana case, um, and the district attorney, who was considered the most progressive district attorney in the United States, wanted jail time for a kid that was basically smoking pot on some steps on Haight Street, um, which was against the law back then. <laughs> Not anymore. But, uh, and so in negotiations with the district attorney, the head of the narcotics unit, it was actually an attorney that had smoked pot in my house at a, <laughs> at a party. And it was very interesting because the defense attorneys, the public defenders, weren't smoking pot, and all the DAs that came through were. And so he's telling me how they're going to have to make an example of this young person. He was like 23 years old and had, was going to college. He had no priors. And the judge, who's now on the Ninth Circuit, very conservative judge, did in fact sentence the defendant to jail. And at the time I said, if you do this, I'm going to spend all of my resources telling people what you're doing. I mean, I'll take out ads in the paper, I'll go on the radio, I'll run for district attorney, I mean, I'll do whatever it takes. So the next day I was in a courtroom and that attorney walked through the head of the narcotics unit. He says, well, you better get your filing money together. And it was really just an insult. Uh, so I did. And I ran, and, and his boss uh, had to listen to me at all these various debates, uh, explain to him what they were doing wrong. Uh, I was elected the next uh, year to the City Council of the Board of Supervisors. I was a member of the Green Party, and a couple of years later became the president of the Board of Supervisors. Um, I was not expected to win the mayor's race that I got into, and in many respects I was not a very good politician. I... Um, I uh, had closed my bank account after being elected to the Board of Supervisors, and when we were making planning decisions, I would often get checks from some of the parties that were appearing before me, and it was so weird. It was like, why are they sending me money? But it, they just understood that that's what you did. You're supposed to pay your respects to the politicians by giving them you know, $500 for their next race or something like that. We would just send it back, of course, my office. Um, but um, I thought getting elected mayor might be easier than having to put together eight out of 11 votes to override a mayoral veto. And that's what motivated me to run. I got into a runoff with very um, uh, low vote totals. I had about 19, 20% of the totals. Uh, it was a wide field. And Newsom had uh, over 40%, I think 42%. So he was expected to win, and it became a very close race. Unfortunately, there were a lot of progressive allies, uh, labor unions, et cetera, who as they tried to assess who they should support, they basically went with him because he was going to win. And in the week before the election, they started saying, oh, man, if we knew it was going to be this close, we might have done this different. Uh, and probably my... Uh, greatest uh, injury in politics was when the uh, a union representing janitors that I had marched with endorsed my opponent, you know, even though all the guys in the room knew me because the, uh, the heads of the union in Sacramento told them to, to do that. Um, I uh, returned to private practice. I didn't seek re-election of the Board of Supervisors. I started a progressive law firm. It was a bunch of lefties, you know, Green Party, uh, you know, attorneys, about six, seven, eight of us at the peak. We filed lawsuits against district attorneys, against police, against grand juries, against, you know, businesses like Comcast and 
national hotels not paying the minimum wage. We didn't. We got into big fights that we didn't have the resources to fully do. But we had some attorneys that were so talented that they could, you know, single-handedly fight entire law firms. Um, I want to. I want to tell the story of some of these cases uh, in Davis because it's it's really just shocking. And I'll rem remind you, David, in 2006, there was a group called Carroll that was trying to um, advocate for citizen oversight of the police department. I wrote an opinion editorial with my law partner at the time that was published in the Davis Enterprise defending the right to speak anonymously because the police were trying to go on chat rooms and try to figure out who was behind the citizen's effort at oversight and try to figure out where the money was coming from. So there are a lot of us that have participated, as you are doing, to make this community more progressive. And, you know, I think we're all in it together. Um, the case you mentioned, I, wa I want to just talk about Khalid's case, the uh, GOAT case, because it's a fascinating uh, uh, example of obvious um, bias. Um, he was represented by another attorney that was urging him to take a plea deal. He came to us and asked us if we would handle it. I was worried that if we took the case over, the judge would want us to go to trial like that day because we were substituting in his counsel on trial date. But we got ready. I showed up. I think it was Judge Fall. And uh, they were extremely hostile to somebody representing uh, you know, his case. And I remember when I appeared in front of him, he said, uh, okay, I understand you're going to be the new attorney on the case, is that correct? And I said, yes, my name's Matt Gonzalez, I'm gonna file a general appearance on the case. And the first thing he said to me was, I'm sorry, counsel, did you mean to say yes, your honor? And I said, no, actually I meant to say yes, which is what I said. <laughs> and, and that's literally how it started. But this is what happened to Khalid. He was actually, he had gone to he was Muslim. He had gone to one of the California agricultural schools and was very interested in state-of-the-art technology. He was married to a you know, California, Caucasian, blonde-haired woman. They were a great couple. They had kids. They were super happy, just law-abiding people. Uh, and they had the best fencing for goats in this entire region. But goats are pretty crafty, and <laughs> these guys would charge the fencing and get through it. Not a big deal, you have dogs to round them up. It's a rural area anyway. And rounding them up, is just a, it's just something you have to do as a goat rancher. Well, Khalid had a problem, which was there was a crop dusting um, operation nearby, and if the planes came in too low, the goats would be frightened and charge the fencing. And so that was actually what was causing them to get out of this state-of-the-art electronic fencing. Um, typically, it's like getting a parking ticket. It's an administrative code violation. They just write a ticket and you probably pay, I don't know, $5 per goat, or, I mean, if anybody even cares. Um, in this case, they did criminally prosecute him for over 100 uh, violations. Uh, we brought a motion, it's called a Murgia motion, that shows discriminatory prosecution, and, and every other goat rancher, Caucasian goat rancher, came forward to sign declarations that in the same time period they had had their goats get out more often than him and had never been prosecuted, never even had a ticket written, and we were able to subpoena those records. And ultimately, it was dismissed when we made these allegations. Judge Fall denied that motion, and we threatened to make it as a trial defense when the DA gave up. Um, another case we handled was the young woman, Halima's case, uh, juvenile, charged in a hit and run. What had happened was her mother with her brothers, uh, mother and, and the mother's uh, sons, had gone to the supermarket. I think it was raining or something. and. Uh, in parking the vehicle, she bumped another car. Um, they didn't pay any attention to it. It wasn't like a big deal. This was a super minor situation. She went home, and I guess someone had written down her um, license plate, and the police came and told her what had happened. She said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I mean, this is a wealthy family. They're, they've got, you know, 
good, solid jobs. I mean, they've never been in trouble at all. And she's like immediately like, oh, my God, give me the information. I'm so sorry. I'm absent-minded. I was on the way home to get dinner, et cetera, et cetera. She immediately contacted the other party, paid for it, the whole thing. The cops got it in their head that her daughter was driving because whoever saw it thought it was a younger person. Um, and the, 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 the son said that that wasn't true, the mother, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, and literally that got criminally prosecuted. When I appeared in court with my law partner, Whitney Lay, African-American from Chicago, uh, we had met in law school, great, just a brilliant lawyer, the best legal writer I've ever uh, been, in, been with. We appeared in front of this judge, and um, he was very unhappy that we were there, and so he started with this sort of like, Okay, well, when are you coming back for the for the pretrial conference? And we said, well, what about the 16th? No, that's too far away. Okay, how about the 12th? I'm not available on the 12th. Okay, how about the 11th? How about the 10th? I mean, I put out five or six dates. Then I said, well, Your Honor, why don't you select a date and we'll be here? You know, I just said it like that. And he said, you know, counsel, I don't appreciate you talking to me like that. He says, why don't we do this? I'm going to put the matter over till tomorrow and we can pick a date tomorrow. Now, he was doing that because he knows we're driving to San Francisco and have to come back. And I appeared on a lot of cases in Davis where that was the deal. Uh, they would call my case last. If I walked out of the courtroom, they'd try to call it. Uh, when I wasn't there using the bathroom or something like that, it was really quite ugly. And I represented the head of the housing authority, David uh, Serena, um, who had a high-performing agency. When he traveled, they shared rooms and slept on the floor. I mean, he worked with Cesar Chavez back in the old days. And the Republican grand jury kept issuing reports saying it was a low-performing agency and alleging that he was misusing mon monies and staying in lavish hotels. And we contacted them and said, look, before you issue your report, because you did it last year and you did it the year before in the year before that, why don't you just tell the truth? I mean, here are the documents. None of this is true. You keep putting out this false information. What was going on was it was all Republicans selected by Republican judges and conservative Democrats, and they were, in effect, trying to undermine him because he was building housing for poor people. So we filed a lawsuit against the Superior Court and the uh, grand jury in this county, in Yolo County, and just said, you can't do it. The way you're picking grand jurors is like your friend. There are no Latinos on the grand jury. It's just, uh, it's just completely discriminatory. Um, the next week, they filed, I don't know, 40-something charges against David for misappropriation of public monies, all felonies. What had he done? Well, he had um, a girlfriend who he later married, and she had two children, minor children, and they were getting medical and dental benefits via his employment with the county. And so they had decided, I, I think they'd been to the dentist one time, they'd gone to the doctor you know, a couple times, and they decided this was criminal activity. So um, fortunately for us, we had filed a lawsuit against the Superior Court, so they recused themselves because they were being sued. And they had to bring in a judge, lucky for us, from Berkeley, California. <laughs> <laughs> you know how this turns out. And uh, they put a, a death penalty prosecutor on the case who was extremely rude. And uh, um, I just said, look, they're, they're, a, they're, a crime has not occurred. We're not going to plead guilty to something. And at the preliminary hearing, we were able to show, I forget if it was the medical or the dental benefits, but one of the benefits, in fact, the law did allow these children to get the benefit from him because they were living in his house. And as to the other benefit, they were not entitled to get it. However, my point was, he never lied in the application. The county gave him the benefit. He told the truth. He says, no, I'm not married to their mother. They're living in my house, whatever, whatever. I said, your mistake doesn't make it a crime. He just applied for the benefit, and you gave it to him. That's your problem, and if you want him to pay you back, you know, a couple hundred dollars, ask him. And that was that. Um, let me tell you a couple of things. It, you know, I know everyone's been sitting a long time, and. If you're bored, by all means, leave. <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm, I, all these memories are coming back because we really litigated these cases, and we cared very deeply 
about trying to do the right thing. We handled other cases here. I don't recall any of them resulting in a conviction. So um, it turned out pretty well. Um, the Garcia Zarate case that I handled, um, you know, just kind of swept up in the, uh, in the, with media attention because of our current president. You may not recall, but he had, um, that, well, you, you recall this, but not the time period with the case I handled. He, he had announced he was running for president after coming down the escalator at uh, Trump Towers, and he disparaged Mexicans and, he, and Mexican immigrants and saying, you know, they're not sending their best people, et cetera. Everybody laughed him off. This was a joke candidacy. Well, two or three weeks later, Kate Steinle dies on Pier 14, a populist tourist location in San Francisco. Young, beautiful, her whole life ahead of her, and she's with her father when she gets shot in the back. It seems completely senseless. And uh, my client, uh, Jose Ines Garcia Zarate, in his 40s, is arrested. He had been deported, oh, I don't know, about five times. He had seven felony convictions. And so Trump started talking about his case and talking about what a terrible fellow this was. And um, uh, I was in Colorado when the elected public defender, Jeff Adachi, called me up and said, hey, we've got this case. Will you take this case? Uh, and he was wondering if I had bandwidth because I was handling another uh, serious murder case at the time. And I said, sure, I'll do it. All we knew at the time was, you know, he had shot this woman at point blank range is what we understood. And he had confessed to it, to a TV camera that weekend. And so I went to see him. I flew back the next day. I, w I went to see him. And immediately I could see there were some mental health issues going on. Very simple. Uh, but he had no violence in his background. No, no history of any kind of violence. And he just, he didn't know uh, Catherine Steinle. He had no reason to hurt her. This was not like a robbery gone bad. He'd never committed a robbery. He'd never committed a theft. This guy was just not the way he was being portrayed. And so we were able to show pretty clearly, um, it, but it was hard to get the media to, 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 to hear this, that the, uh, he was seated on the pier when the gun was fired. The bullet struck about 12 feet where, from where he was and traveled another I believe it was 70 or 80 feet before it struck Steinle in the back. It's a totally freak occurrence. You could not, you could be an expert marksman and not be able to ricochet a bullet off concrete and accurately hit someone that far away. He got up and, and split, and that was kind of, that, that was the case. Um, I started realizing that his prior convictions were actually very minor when you broke them down. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about them because one of the takeaways is how bad immigration law is and how things like Sanctuary City and Kate's Law get wrapped up into a narrative that, you know, it's like it doesn't fit. This isn't the right case to be dealing with national legislative solutions. And here's why. He had, in the early 1990s, while he was up in the state of Washington, he had some what were uh, drug cases. Today, they would all be misdemeanors. They were basically drug possession. However, in like 1993, he pled guilty to one for uh, possession for sale. Now, the, the report, I read it, he had no money on him, and there was residue in a plastic baggie. The police thought he was in a drug transaction. They offered him, a, I don't know, credit for time served deal. If he pled guilty for a possession for sale, he pled to it. It's not a big deal. He already had a, some felonies. And these were, this is drug activity in between his laborer jobs and out of season while he's just trying to survive. Well, the federal law, it's 8 U.S.C. 1326. Chuck mentioned this statute because it relates to illegal entry into the United States. And I want to break it down for you like this. If you come from Mexico to the United States without documentation, you're going to get deported. Maybe you'll be in custody for a little bit before they deport you. Maybe you'll get six months or a year. Maybe if you're a repeat offender, they'll hold you for a couple of years. 
But that's pretty much, that's it. You know, the, 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 it's, the universe is relatively, you know, you know what it is. However, if you have been deported on what's called an aggravated felony, murder, rape, all the sex crimes, explosives, right? You're going to do your jail time in the United States. Then you're going to be deported. And if you come back to the United States, you're facing 20 years. And it's not a joke. Like, you'll get a lot of jail time. Okay, that kind of makes some sense. If you did a serious crime here, we really don't want you back. Problem is, aggravated felony includes murder, rape, all those offenses, and any amount of drug trafficking. So any marijuana felony, the sale or possession for sale, any small amount of any other contraband, means that Garcia Zarate, when he pled guilty for possession for sale for virtually no jail time to some residue in a bag, he's now facing 20 years every time he comes here. First time he came, they negotiated it, five-year sentence. He appeared in court, I think, two times. Did his five years, they deported him, he came back for work. Because, you know, in certain parts of Mexico, there's really extreme poverty. Uh, they catch him. He's committed no crime other than en entering. They negotiate six years. He does six years, gets deported, comes back. They offer him seven years this time. So he does five, six, seven, okay? Part of why he keeps coming back is he doesn't understand why he's getting the jail time because he's got like some cognitive issues. And so he doesn't understand like what he did to merit this and so he's not changing his behavior. So. Um, the feds are about to deport him, but San Francisco has an old warrant for him. It's a 20-year-old marijuana case, and they've ignored it every other time they've deported him. But this time, they bring him to San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, he appears in a courtroom. They dismiss it immediately, and the feds don't uh, pick him up because the San Francisco sheriff wants there to be a legitimate uh, warrant or a probable cause document from the courts to release him to the feds. The feds don't get the document. San Francisco actually holds him in custody for about two or three weeks without any legal reason. And finally, they just let him out in the street. Goes out on the street, he's just living on the Embarcadero, he's wearing clothes he found. Uh, they won't hire him in the Mexican restaurants, but they feed him a little bit. He doesn't beg for money. He doesn't steal. He, he literally, he looks so poor when people are walking by in an affluent tourist area that people just give him their leftover dinners that they're taking home. They're like, oh my God, would you like this? That's literally how he's surviving. And he does that for about three months before this incident happens. And he swears up and down he found a gun at the seat that he sat down on the pier wrapped up in something. He investigated it and it fired the bullet. And that's what he said. Now, it was hard for people to believe that you could actually find a gun on the pier wrapped up. But then stop and think about it. We have, you know, over a hundred million guns um, in our society. I mean, it's, it's a crazy number. There are accidental shootings that happen every day. I think it's something like 40 every day. Somebody dies, I think the number's three people die every two days from an accidental shooting. So it turned out we were able to get some surveillance footage from about, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away from a, a fire boat. It was grainy, but it revealed something very significant, which was before Garcia Zarate sat down at that chair, there was a congregation of about six, seven people. They had a nap sack or a bag with them. They were talking. They were there. They were together for about 20 minutes. They weren't tourists. This is a pier that everybody walks onto, walks down to the end, looks at the site, and walks off, which is what Catherine Steinle was doing with her father. Garcia Zarate didn't do that because he's just a homeless guy sitting on a chair swiveling around. But these people could very well have been discarding a gun. Now, why would they discard the gun? It turned out to belong to a Bureau of Land Management ranger who had left it unsecured in his vehicle and it had been stolen a few days earlier. And we argued very clearly that Garcia Zarate had no history for stealing. He had not tried to offer 
the, any object for sale in the preceding days that he was arrested. And um, I mean, I, th I don't even think he had 10 cents in his pocket. And there were other things of value stolen from the vehicle, laptop computers, credit cards, all kinds of stuff. There were many things that happened during the trial that frustrated us because I felt the judge wanted a different outcome. He, was a Schwarz he is a Schwarzenegger appointment. And um, he did a lot of things that um, we think uh, resulted in Garcia Zarate not getting a fair trial. Now he was found not guilty of the murder and manslaughter charges and that's why it was celebrated as a big victory. But he was convicted of gun possession and I'll give you an idea of why th that shouldn't have happened. Basically, the, the judge would not instruct the jury on this idea of a momentary possession. And think of it this way. If I hand you a bag and you don't know what's in it, and you say, what's this? And I say, oh, have a look. And you open it, look in it, and there's contraband in there. And you put it on the ground. You say, I don't want this. You hand it back to me. Have you committed the crime of possessing that contraband? Well, I think the answer is no. You didn't know. You had no knowledge. And uh, if you, once you had knowledge and it was in your hand, the only possession you had was to get rid of it. Well, that was what we were trying to explain to the judge, that look, Garcia Zarate did not know it was a gun. He's handling it. It fires. At that moment, the jury says, well, it is in his hands. Is he guilty of possession? And they asked for instructions from the judge, and he would not properly instruct them on the law. There were a lot of other things that happened. The, the Bureau of Land Management officer was allowed to testify to all the safety precautions he took, but it, the judge wouldn't let us tell the jury that he actually had a second loaded firearm in the car, also not secured properly, that had not been stolen, things like that. And one of the things that in the course of this trial that was most frustrating was that the firearm that he had was an elite firearm that can be fired with a very low trigger pull. The, fact the factory trigger pull of this gun when it's in single action mode is like 4.4 pounds. And this is a gun without a safety. It's meant for law enforcement to be able to reach for this gun and start firing, not to be messing around with the safety. This is a gun you have as a secondary weapon that you reach for if you're in trouble. That's the, that's the concept. It's a very well-made firearm, but it's got a very light trigger pull. So we um, were trying to demonstrate how low the trigger pull was to the jury, and we were making a simulator that couldn't actually fire a bullet but would allow a jury to test the simulator. Uh, we had a firearms expert in Canada making the simulator and we told the court about it. We weren't in possession of it yet, but it was in the mail to us. And we told them when we got it, we would turn it over to the DA. They could test it and the whole thing. Well, the DA was very upset, so there's no simulator. We're going to object if the jury should see the real gun. So we said, fine, let them test the trigger pull on the real gun. The judge said, great, we're, we're all in agreement. Well, a few days later, the DA changes her mind. Before I can even be heard on the subject, the judge agrees with her. And so the DA argued to the jury that 4.4 that pounds is like lifting a five pound bag of sugar. That's what it takes to fire this gun. When the truth was squirt guns, our expert tested some children squirt guns at, at trigger pulls of like four pounds. I mean, this is a very light trigger pull. And, um, you know, this was the kind of gamesmanship that was happening in court. Anyway, I could go on and on. I, let me just say a couple of other things about the law. I, I mentioned this idea of this illegal reentry based on the aggravated felony. I want to just say about Sanctuary City. I think it, it hurts us when everybody is presenting Sanctuary City as a municipality fighting the federal authority and that we want to have our own laws and we don't have to follow what the feds are doing. And I don't, I don't think that that works because we're a nation of laws and that seems to make sense to people. They don't understand what are we going to do, be ruled by local authorities when there's, you know, federal law. And here's why that argument is wrong. 
what has happened in a 10-year period, it was, it was uh, proven that ICE and Homeland Security uh, arrested 1,500 U.S. citizens by mistake. They put detainers on them. They would call the sheriff of a county and say, put a detainer on that person. We're going to deport them. Turned out they got it wrong 1,500 times in that time period. So the courts in uh, Nevada, uh, North Dakota, Rhode Island, uh, I think uh, Utah, a number of different places said, no, 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 you can't do it that way. You have to present probable cause, a warrant, a probable cause instrument that says this person's not a citizen and subject to deportation. We have to see that before the municipality does what you want. That's what's actually going on. It's the federal authorities, ICE and Homeland Security, that don't want to follow federal law. It's the municipality that's following federal law because federal law gets interpreted by the courts. And that's really the fight. The final thing I want to say is, you know, I was thinking about why is it that immigration is such a hot topic right now? Like, why is it that there's so many people here in this country that appear to be here without documentation? Like, was it always this way? When I was growing up, was it this way? It just seems so peculiar that this is so much a thing. And it turns out that in 1952, um, there was a national immigration law that was passed that changed something in the law that is causing the problem that we have now. And it relates to something in law that we call statute of limitations. So when you commit a crime, typically you have to be prosecuted for it within a certain amount of time. So like let's say, unless it's murder, right? There's no statute of limitations on the crime of murder. But let's say you commit a misdemeanor. Some states, you have to be prosecuted within a year or within three years. Some states with felonies have three-year statute of limitations. Some maybe go to five years. And what this means is I could admit to doing a crime 10 years ago, hey, I stole that stuff from you when we were roommates. I'm sorry I shouldn't have done it. You can't prosecute me for it. It's just too many years ago. Well, this law in 1952 changed the statute of limitations for illegally entering the country. Because that's the crime, right? You illegally entered the country without documentation. So the clock starts the day you entered. And let's say five years later, they can't prosecute you for it. Now, you're not a citizen, so you have to apply to become a citizen. But the law had a built-in amnesty. What did the law do? The law changed the statute of limitations not to start running from when you entered, but to start running from when you were discovered here without documentation, which meant you never obtained amnesty. And that's why you've had this proliferation of these cases. Anyway, I've talked enough. It's a real delight to be back and to David and Cecilia. I really appreciate everything you guys have done because from the very outset, I mean, you guys just took on so much. You were always supportive. Anytime we needed anything, they were there 100%. And congratulations on, on this event and everything you've done. Thank you. So we do have a little bit of time for audience questions, and uh, there are mics on the side of uh, the room. Um, try to actually ask a question if you're interested rather than making a statement, um, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but if you have a question, uh, you can get up behind the mic and uh, and ask it, or if you just want to go, then that's fine too. <laughs> so I don't know. Does anyone have a I question? Got a question. No. Okay, perfect. For uh, Mr. Gonzalez, if you don't okay. mind. Uh, there's a scenario going on right now in Guatemala where we have like seven or eight thousand um, Guatemalans or whatever's going on in those central countries that may be reaching the border within the next two to three weeks, and the dummy in the White House is about, has sent like 800 troops to the border. They may not all get there, the seven or 8,000, but some of these people are going to wind up at the border, from my understanding. You know, they're 
escaping a, a life of a crime being committed against them. What happens there once they get to the border? Well, I, I think for me, I'm most interested in the kind of rhetoric of how these folks are perceived because, you know, it's very different. Like the way you think of like illegal immigration, you know, undocumented people coming here, when you understand that they're fleeing American foreign policy decisions, then you get it. Like there's like literally the tens of thousands of guns that we have sold into Mexico contributing to, to the, the rampant crime there and the drug cartels. Or you take something like NAFTA, where you've got, you know, our subsidizing of American corn so it can be sold for less than it can be grown in Mexico means that you're putting Mexican farmers out of work. And it starts to feel different about why are they are coming. And I think, you know, I'm not an expert in foreign policy, but I think the same argument goes for folks coming from Central America. So many of those nations are ravaged by, you know, certainly the 20th century United States, um, you know, really undermining of democratic regimes, et cetera, there. What's going to happen when they get here? I mean, folks can come and... and uh, make application for asylum. I think that that's going to be the process. The question of whether or not Trump's tactics of trying to harm people physically and mentally to, to injure them so much that they give up. I mean, I don't know how that plays out. Uh, I am bothered that a rule like illegal reentry for an aggravated felony that applies to any amount of marijuana sale has been on the books for God, two, three decades. I mean, ever since I've been a lawyer, and even the Democrats have not stood up to change that law. Sure, hi. Um, I wonder if you could advise us in the Vanguard or any tonight about concrete things we can do. Like, it's disturbing to read the story about Maria. What do we do? I think um, I, last year we knew what to do. We worked for a new public defender and we came, I mean, district attorney, and we came close. But what do we do this year? Well, one thing I like to do is I like to write the truth. And I like to put people's names in those articles and make them read about the injustices that they're engaged in because it bothers them. And when, <laughs> when, when their friends or they, they Google themselves, these articles are out there in the world. And I'll tell you, we had some public defenders run for judge and, um, uh, in San Francisco. It's very hard to beat incumbents, but they ran against conservative judges. And the judges were sitting Court of Appeal judges and a state Supreme Court judge basically got out there and were writing a you know, letters and editorials to the legal papers saying what an outrage it was and every lawyer should oppose this kind of attack on the judiciary. It was all rubbish, right? But one of the judges that signed on to a letter was a Supreme Court judge, Democratic appointed, uh, who basically taught at Stanford, I mean my alma mater. He never even did a deposition. He'd never tried a case. And it was like, you know, I wrote an article that in parts basically said to him, you're not even as qualified as these people, like shut up, you know? And I didn't say it that way, but the point was made, which was, you know, this is, this is a democracy. People are running for office. If you don't want judicial elections, then change the constitution. That's the way the law, and you're supposed to uphold the law, not attack it, you know, and that sort of thing. So I think it's very effective. That's just something you have to do. You'll get better at writing things. My writing has gotten better. You may be a great writer to start with, but I just mean, you know, and you, whether you, whether you publish it in the newspaper or you create your own places to publish it, people read it and find it. And it gets circulated. Everybody knows the details of what's happening to somebody and they can join forces and, and the powers that be feel the pressure. Hi, my name is Desiree Rojas, and I'm a resident of Davis. Um, for many years, we have been fighting this DA, Jeff Rising. He attacked Maria Grijalva. We are part of the community that, um, that supported Maria. And thank God they dropped the 
um, I guess it was a complaint. <laughs> um, so in, in the press conference that we had before she entered the courthouse, uh, we stated in our press statement that we uh, are demanding that uh, Javier um, Becerra, uh, the uh, Attorney General, to conduct expeditiously uh, uh, an investigation into prosecutorial misconduct. And so my question is, is what can we do to really put the pressure on him to do his job to get this DA to start the investigation? Well, I think the state attorney general has a good reputation. And um, I don't know him personally. I've heard him speak. Um, but personally, I like when, 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 you know, a lot of times people in authority hide behind the strict reading of the law to say, well, I'm just, you know, uh, charging you with a crime that you may have committed, and it looks like you committed. A very powerful tool is the case I mentioned earlier, the Murgia case, which basically allows you to get your case dismissed if you can show discriminatory prosecution. And in this case, you have a Latina woman um, who is being singled out. The question is, is there anybody of any other category, you know, in terms of gender or race, that they have not criminally prosecuted, that they could have for the very same thing? It's a very powerful tool, and it's been used, I've used it successfully um, to allege that, hey, why are you only arresting the Latino guys selling drugs in the, in the city square and not the African Americans or Caucasian guys who have a marijuana club around the corner or whatever? Or, you know, out at San Quentin, there would be fights in the jail and only the African American guys would get prosecuted in the county courthouse. The Caucasian guys that got in fights, ah, oh, it's an administrative matter, we'll deal with it in house. That's a Murgia motion. And what Murgia does is it gives you, if you can make a showing that there appears that there might be discrimination here, you can ask to subpoena and to make the prosecution turn over the records that you need to prove your situation. So for instance, in the, in, the, in the marijuana case, a Latino arrested in a drug case, I put together a declaration with the names of 40 or 50 other guys being charged for the same offense, all of whom were Latino. So I was saying, okay, here I'm showing you all the guys being prosecuted. I wanna see the records, like show me who's being arrested so I can figure out why you're not prosecuting them. And uh, so that's worth asking a lot of questions in, in trying to sort that out. And if you've got a district attorney that has run for office, I would scrutinize his own campaign finances, you know? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, you said a few minutes ago that local mu municipalities want to obey the laws, but it's the feds that don't, and it's pretty obvious, we know that. So I'm trying to understand the mentality, and this is a pattern throughout the Trump administration, not just locally with, uh, or with immigration issues, but I'm trying to understand this whole thing that they do, not wanting to follow the laws. Is it because they think, uh, well, first of all, it's arrogance, we know that, and it's a lot of other things, but do they think we're gonna push it until someone sues us, or do, we think, or do they think yeah. the laws don't apply to them, or do they think, what's this mentality? Well, yeah. It's pervasive. Well, they're bullies fundamentally, yeah. Yeah. and what they're doing is they're gonna put pressure to make Congress change the law. So, or to get judges on the bench that aren't gonna agree with those other judges. And what they're doing is they're basically saying, rather than follow the law, we're gonna ignore it, and every time someone like Katherine Steinle gets hurt, we're just gonna blame the municipality. And eventually, people are gonna get so upset that the law's gonna change, you know? They, they, they have the long view, and they're willing to let a lot of people get hurt in the process, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, and thank you to all our speakers and everybody who uh, spent their time here. Thanks.